In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to do that again. I want a good, this is a great house of uh, leaders. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for this uh, leaders meeting. Thank you for your people, servants of God, men and women. And we thank you for the various areas of work you've called us to. And thank you for the anointing that breaks every yoke in everybody's life. We're asking, O oh Lord, that tonight you open our eyes of understanding to behold and see wondrous things from your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Lift up your people. Amen. Raise up your people. Amen. Transform our leaders. Amen. Let your power, your wisdom, your insight, your vision come upon every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Let your people be greater leaders better leaders, visionary leaders, so that Lord this work will prosper in our hands together in Jesus name take discouragement away and take everything that is negative away in Jesus name break every yoke in our lives and let this work be a work that is progressing in the whole church in Jesus name we well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. Happy to be with you once again. What a full house we have today. It's always an encouragement when we see the house full, the floor and the gallery and everywhere. And I think there are even some people outside. The Lord reach out to you and bless you there in Jesus' name. Amen. And something will be added to your life today. Am I talking to somebody there? There will be an addition, a multiplication of the power of God and the wisdom of God in our lives in Jesus' name. Now, we're going to look at some verses in the uh, passages we have read. We're doing this for a purpose. You see, there are times we take a particular verse in isolation. And we will see that, we we'll run with that, without connecting that verse with other verses of scripture. I'm reading from our memory verse today. This is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 29. And I'm reading here from verse 9. 1 Samuel chapter 29, verse 9. And Achish answered and said to David, I know that thou art good, notice the word, in my sight. Thou art good in my sight. He's never seen anything wrong in David. I never seen any action that was wrong in David. And he said, you are good in my sight as an angel of God. As an angel of God. He said, I can't compare you to any man I've ever seen. I cannot compare you to any man in the kingdom here, any man in Israel, anyone I ever heard about. The only thing I can compare you with will be an angel of God. Uh, let's uh, go back to verse 3. In verse 3 it says, Then said the princes of the Philistines, What do these Hebrews hear? And Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, Is not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which has been with me these days or these years, and I have found no fault in him notice that i have found no fault in him since he fell unto me until this day look at verse 6 it says then achish called david and said unto him surely there's no doubt here in the heart of achish surely as the lord liveth, thou hast been upright and thy going out and thy coming in with me in the host of in the host is good in my sight. Always notice that. He said, This is my personal opinion of you. I've watched you, I've seen you, I've examined everything, and in my sight have not found any fault. He goes on to say, For I have not found evil in in thee since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day i want to examine the scriptures with you today on the life threatening danger of mistaking identity 
the life-threatening danger of mistaking identity. You'll find here that Achish referred to David and he said, you are as an angel of God. And let's go to 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel chapter 14, here comes a woman and we're told that this woman was a wise woman. And Joab sent the woman to David because Absalom had run away from the kingdom, from the nation. And then eventually now, Joab was making arrangements so that David will call Absalom and bring Absalom back. That's why he selected this, he chose this a wise woman, wise woman in quotes, to come and talk to David. Look at chapter 14, 2 Samuel chapter 14, we're reading from verse 7. It says, then, then handmaid said, the word of my Lord, the king, shall now be comfortable. For as an angel of God, so is my Lord, the king, to discern good and bad. Here's the second time somebody is referring to David. And this woman said, we know you. We've been looking at you and we'll watch you and we'll see all your actions and you're as an angel of God. He says, so is my Lord the king to discern good and bad. Therefore the Lord thy God will be was thee. He's saying because you, you're like an angel and your life is good, you have understanding, you have wisdom, you have knowledge. Because of this, the Lord will be able to look at verse 20 to fetch about this form of speech. As thy servant Joab done this thing, and my Lord is, tell me, wise according to the wisdom, tell me, of an angel of God to know all things that are done in the earth. This really, really puts it on. It says, David, we know that you have knowledge and you have wisdom and you're like an angel of God. We're coming to another passage and this is now chapter 19 of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 19. And we're looking at verse 27. In 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 27, it says, And he has slandered thy servant unto my Lord the king. But my Lord the king is as an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. Here's Mephibosheth. He is the third person that comes to David and is saying, Whatever you do, I'll accept that. Do whatever is good in your sight because I see you as an angel, as an angel of God. As you listen to all these statements that are said about David, first of all, David himself wouldn't believe everything they said. He wouldn't believe that it was like an angel of God because he himself knew himself. He knew his life. He knew what he just did, and he knew the people he wiped out, and he wiped out all those people so that nobody will report anything. And since there was no way for Achish to know that this is what David has done, every time David appeared before him, he says, I'm looking at an angel. I'm looking at somebody pure. I'm looking at somebody good. I'm looking at somebody that has no fault at all. And Achish was easily deceived. In the case of the woman, that is the wise woman that came and told the David, you are as an angel of God, it was just flattery. And the David should have seen through that flattery that they're trying to bring Absalom back. And whatever you can say to David that will ease him up and make him happy and feel flattered and feel exalted, you are like an angel of God. Whatever they could say, it would bite the bait. And that's how he was deceived and eventually Absalom came back. And in the case of Mephibosheth, we'll go to the details later, you will see that Mephibosheth wanted the field back because his servant uh, that uh, David put in charge had tried to take everything from him and also slandered him. And this man came now wanting something. He wanted favor. And because of the favor he wanted, he said, how can I praise this man? How can I lift him up? How can I make him to ride a kind of an invisible horse and show him that we appreciate him, we honor him, and we exalt him? 
But the only thing I can say is that you look like an angel to me. And whatever you want to do for me, I will not even question you. Whatever you do is the action of an angel. Mistaking identity in our lives, in the ministry. There are people that come to us. You want to be very careful that you analyze everything they are saying. And you want to understand that this thing they are saying, you are an angel, you are this, you are that, might just be words of flattery. And maybe words of deception. And if you ride on that, you may ride to injury and to danger. We're looking at the life-threatening danger of the of mistaking identity there are three things we're going to look at number one the unmasking of apparent angels before men unmask unveil disclose remove the mask from their faces unmask the apparent angels before men they say they are angels take the mask off their faces and see who they really are number two is the undoing of apprehensive angels in ministry apprehensive angels this one looks like an angel david looks like an angel but he's apprehensive and he's asking the woman is not the hand of joab with you in this matter although it was like an apprehensive person wanting to know somebody sent you to say this somebody sent you to tell me this all the same he couldn't discern and became his undoing the undoing of apprehensive angels in ministry number three the uncertainty of apathetic angels with mortals here is a mortal man there is a mephibosheth and uh, the, is from the family of saul and from the family of jonathan because mephibosheth was a son to jonathan a grandson to saul and now he came and as he came david said where have you been I was driven out of town i lost the throne and i couldn't find you and uh, you said because they did you see me you know i'm lame and i couldn't uh, make up uh, for myself for somebody to saddle the ass for me and for me to follow after you and david said okay what have you come for now he was apathetic really even though the man said you're an angel of god uh-huh i hear you but an apathetic angel and because he was dealing with mortals at this time the Lord wants us to be wise. When people come before you and they, you know, build you up and raise you up and lift you up and, you know, they make you climb the ivory tower there, be very careful and listen to everything they are saying so that you will know whether they are really for, you know, sincere or they are not sincere. I pray God will grant us the wisdom in Jesus' name. We're coming to number one, the unmasking of apparent angels before men we come to chapter 29 once again that is first samuel chapter 29 and we're reading from verse 6 for samuel chapter 29 and we're reading from verse 6 it tells us in verse 6 it's in the achish called david and said unto him surely as the Lord liveth, is making mention of the name of the Lord. This is the God of Israel, capital L-O-R-D. It's a, this is a, your Jehovah. As the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright, and thy going out and coming in with me in the host is good in my sight, for I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day look at verse 9 it says an echish answered and said to david i know that thou art good others may not know i know echish i know that you are good in my sight as an angel of god notwithstanding the princes of the philistines have said he shall not go up with us to the battle and then we come to chapter 27 and let's unmask the angel let's take the mask off the face of this angel let's uncover this angel unveil this angel let's look at him in reality chapter 27 i'm reading from verse 8 
and David and his men went up and invaded the uh, Geshur, Gershurites and the Gezrites and the Amalekites. For those nations were of old, the inhabitants of the land of the land, as thou goest to show even unto the land of Egypt. And David, tell me the word there, smote the land. That's the good man. Smote the land. That's the angel. The angel. That's a faultless man before Achish. And David smote the land and left neither man nor woman alive. Uh, what you think of our precious life is, what you think about eternity, when you think about the person that dies without Christ and without salvation, without righteousness, even the Old Testament righteousness, when you think about somebody who dies without preparation for eternity, and you think of where they will spend eternity, and David thoughtless about eternity, and David thoughtless about the state of these people, these were pagan people. These were heathen people. These were people, if he knew the word of God, was it not David that wrote the psalm that God is angry with the wicked every day? Didn't he know that these people were wicked and he killed them without settling their, their situation with the Lord? Wasn't it David that wrote in the psalms that the people that forget God, the Lord will throw them into hellfire? Wasn't he the one that wrote Psalm 24 and Psalm 50? Who is he that will go up to the mountain of the Lord that will stand in his holy hill? The people that have the clean hands and then pure heart. David, these people you're killing and destroying. Number one, what have they done to David? Nothing. He just wanted to take their sheep. He wanted to take their asses. He wanted to take the things that belong to them. This is a good man Ikish was talking about. This is the angel of God Ikish was talking about. And it goes on to say in verse 10, it says, uh, and, and, and David said, he gave the, uh, sorry, uh, let's, um, uh, verse, uh, let's come back to verse 8. In verse 8, the middle, Oh, let's come back to verse 9. And David smote the land and left neither man nor woman alive. And he took away, what did he take away? Sheep. He took away the sheep. You think about that. A man that counted the sheep that he wanted for his own selfish consumption. He counted the sheep more important than the men, than the women. And he killed them and destroyed them so he could have their sheep and the oxen and the asses and the camels and the apparel and their clothing. And then it says, and he returned and he came to Achish. And he acted as if nothing had happened. And you look at his face, his face, and it was like plastic. It was like everything was normal. What kind of man is this? A man that will not kill Saul, just one man, and he killed all these men. A man that will not kill an enemy, and he killed the neutral people that had done nothing against him. Innocent people, defenseless people. That he just killed them. And now he came to Achish. And Achish said, wonderful, welcome. What an angel you are. That man was deceived. You see, there are people like that. You will not be, you'll not be able to tell. You cannot tell about their lives. The things they do. And the consequence of the things they do. And the way they project themselves. And the way they talk. It's like you've seen an angel of God. Unmask that angel. Unveil that angel. Discover that angel. And see, there is danger in their hearts and in their relationship. I'm coming to uh, verse, uh, we're looking at uh, verse uh, 11. And David saved neither man nor woman alive. It says to bring tidings to God. That's the only reason he killed everybody. Anybody that will survive that massacre, anybody that will survive that killing, so that they will not tell on him, it was a man to cover up. Are there people that, you know, you think they're angels, you think they're righteous, you think they're very good, you know why? Because they are masters at covering up. 
at covering up. They have covered their evil. They have covered their atrocities. And because of the covering up, you think everything is all right. It says, so, uh, so did David, and so will he. That is, uh, he was uh, doing this so that Aki should not say he'll be doing this as long as he's dwelling with me. Look at verse 12 now. And Aki believed who? Tell me out loud. He believed David. David, where was his conscience at this time? What was his human feeling at this time? And what did he do with the cries of those people that he massacred and killed? And then he came out of that place as if nothing happened and Ikish could not discover anything. You know that there are people like that in the world that if you didn't have the gifts of the spirit and discernment you'll not understand what they have done and where they have been. And it says, and Ikish believed David. And then it says, seeing he has made his people Israel utterly to abhor him. Therefore, he shall be my servant forever. The man was looking for cheap labor. He was looking for a servant. And all these 600 men that are following after David is going to raise an army of bodyguards for me. And he wasn't even ready to check up anything or to investigate anything or to examine anything. And he was easily deceived that an angel was before him. And that's what the Lord is telling us in 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And here we're reading from verse 7. 1 Samuel Chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on, on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, rejected him. And it says, For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. Obviously, the Lord seeth not as Achish seeth. The Lord seeth not as ignorant people that do not know the characters of the people they are dealing with as they see. There are people that can pretend in the church until they get a wife and snatch a sister out of the church. There are people that can pretend until they snatch a business partner who is rich and who has resources and he does not know how to make use of those resources until they snatch that away. There are people who can pretend until they take your farm. That is, you are farming, you are into agriculture and this fellow wants to be a business partner and you think they are good and you think they are angels of God. There are people that can take all your life savings because you this is an angel. An angel has come to you and without prayer and without knowing that this fellow is the most wicked person you have ever met in your life all your life savings you are going to give to them You say if I partner with this one we're going to make it and we're going to make a good gain and things are going to be alright until you get into that business and discovered I thought it was an angel. When they are far away they look like angels. When you have no relationship with them, they look like angels. When there's no other person to talk about them, and they shield you from all their friends, and they shield you from all their acquaintances, so that nobody of the people that actually know them will get to you, they look like angels. And you're in a hurry to decide. You're in a hurry to associate with this David. In a hurry, to, because forever, this man and all the people... This man killed Goliath. Think about that. A man that killed Goliath to be my servant and to be following after me and to be my bodyguard and he has trained all these 600 people. I'm going to be totally secured. Akish, you are deceived. Why it not for those elders and the leaders in uh, Gaz that said, this man to go with us, now you tell me. If David had followed them to battle as Achish was planning, and then he got to the battlefield, you'll see Saul there, because you are going to find out this is the battle that led to the death of Saul. As you come to chapter 28, when Saul was asking, Will I win this battle or not? And God will not answer him. He was so desperate that he went to the witch of Endom, and eventually he died in that battle. What will David have done? If David had gone with these people and he saw the people he was to reign over, 
would he now be on the side of Achish and they begin to kill the Israelites? Is going to turn around and kill all these people. And so the elders realized that this man, when we get to the battlefield, Achish, you'll be surprised. He'll finish us. It means that we have written our doom already. If this David, this angel, this good man, this one you've never found, found any fault in. If he follows us, we're all gone. That person you are trying to bring to your family, that angel that nobody has witnessed about and nobody has spoken about and you're bringing her to your family. She's an angel. I hear you. You'll tell another story if you're not careful. That man you're bringing into the business, you'll tell another story. That person you're saying, I trust him. In fact, we're going to be co-signatories into this account. I don't even care. If he wants to be, the man is so honest, you know? And the man is so good. And the man is so transparent. In fact, I've never met an angel like this before. I don't care if he's going to be the only signatory to this new account in the, you know, the business we're going to do. Because the man, I trust him. You trust him, you'll come for counseling later. But today, instead of waiting till everything is upside down, then you are coming for counseling, be counseled today. And beware. And don't allow the pictures that people paint and the things they say, don't allow that to deceive you. You will not be deceived in Jesus' name. We're looking at Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I'm reading from chapter 40. Jeremiah. We're looking at chapter 40. Uh, you know, sometimes human beings, some of them have perfected this uh, art of deception and the art of making themselves look like angels. And when you get into their net, thank God you will not get into that net. When you get into that net, you'll be surprised what happens eventually. I'm looking at Jeremiah chapter 40, and we're reading from verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 40, verse 14. And said unto him, hey, Dost thou certainly know that um, Bela, Bela, or that's uh, the name there, the king of uh, the Ammonites, has uh, a saint Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to slay thee, but get uh, Gedaliah, the son of uh, Ahikam, believed them not. Here is uh, Gedaliah. What had happened is that Nebuchadnezzar had made him king uh, over the remnants of the people that remained in the land. And there was somebody called Ishmael. He was going to kill him. And somebody knew. And then they came to say, do you know certainly? There's no doubt in this one. We're giving you the information that your life is at stake. And then and uh, it says, Gedaliah believed them not. Look at verse 15. Then Johanan, the son of Keriah and spake to Gedaliah in Mizpah secretly saying let me go I pray thee and I will slay uh, Ishmael the son of Nathaniah and no man shall know it wherefore should he slay thee if you are careless Gedaliah this man will finish you then and that all the Jews which are gathered unto thee shall be scattered and the remnant in Judah perish but Gedaliah the son of Ahikam unto said unto Johanan the son of Keriah thou shalt not do this sin for thou for thou tell me speakest falsely of Ishmael his life was at stake and somebody told him his life was at stake and said look at that man that man is after you is going to finish you he'll take you off and all the people that are around you is going to finish them he said i don't believe that ishmael is a good person ishmael is a nice person i can't find anybody as nice as ishmael you are telling me a lie concerning ishmael look at chapter 41 in chapter 41 here we're looking at it from verse 1 chapter 41 from verse 1 now it came to pass in the seventh month that tell me the name there 
Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, the son of Elishama, and the seed royal, and the princes of the king, even ten men was him, came to who? Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, to Mizpah, and there the did Tell me out loud. They did eat bread together in Mispe. Gedaliah says, welcome, welcome. Look at the nice man. Even look at his face. Look at his stature. And look at his attitude. The man is so nice. And this is the person they are telling me, telling me wanted to kill me. And they told lies against him. Come on here. Sit down together. And they ate together. Be very careful. Be very careful. You do not know these people you say are good. They are angels of God. You've never met so nice people in your life before. We're looking at verse 2. Then arose who? Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, and the ten men that were with him. What? The nice man smote Gedaliah. The one that came to fellowship smote Gedaliah. The one that they just ate together now. And then Gedaliah made all the preparation for the food. Because he didn't believe that Ishmael was that bad. You couldn't see it on Ishmael's face. You couldn't see it in the language. You couldn't tell. This man is nice. This man is good. Akish and Gedaliah of the same family spiritually. They had no discernment that this is dangerous. I pray you'll wake up. Amen. You know that anybody who is not saved is a potential danger. Even those who say they are saved, you need to find out the time they got saved. You need to find out how they got saved. You need to find out what's the grace of God in their lives. And it says over here, and it slew him. And then it says, uh, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. And Ishmael also slew, tell me all the Jews that were within. You see, when you are careless, and when you throw the gates open, and when you say, no problem, I love everybody, and there is, you, there's no guard, and there's, there's no protection, you're not only endangering your life, you're endangering the lives of other people too. Even with Gedaliah at Mispe, and uh, the Chaldeans that were, with, that were found there, and the men of war, is still all of them, verse 4. And it came to pass the second day after he had slain Gedaliah. And tell me, no man knew it. These people, they know how to cover up. They know how to cover up. Nobody knew anything about it. And that's the thing we need to be very careful of. This secretive meeting, secretive kind of thing. I, I want to see you. And I want to have a meeting with you. Can I come with my wife? No, this is not women's business. I just want to have this personal heart-to-heart -heart fellowship with you. And uh, you know, there's a big deal here. There's something wonderful here. We're going to talk about, if you bring, uh, you know, bring your wife, you know, what do women know about what we're trying to discuss? Okay, if I cannot bring my wife, can I bring my fellow brother? He's a good person. What do they know about what we are talking about? We're talking about something wonderful. We don't want anybody to know this so that they will not snatch the great business away from us before we conclude. Be very careful. All those secretive people, all those people, don't let them know. Don't let them hear. And we're going to get this through. Let's look at this now. We're looking at verse 5. That there came Satan from Shechem and uh, from Shiloh. And from Samaria, even four score men having their beards shaven and their clothes arranged and having caught themselves, and it says with offering and incense and in, the, in, in their hands, and to bring them to the house of the Lord. And Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, went forth from Mispe to meet them. Tell me the word. Weeping. Weeping. Weeping all along. What's making him to weep? The man is so tender. 
and the man is so soft and the man is so gentle that as he was going on something had happened and he's so sorrowful about it and he's weeping can you think about that you've not uh, lived too long in this world there are many kinds of characters in the world and if they're weeping and their attitude and their appearance if you go by that alone you are gone i pray you'll be wise look beyond those tears and look beyond all those pretenses that these are the people they are not dependable you cannot stake your life on them and let's look at this and it went on and it says a weeping all along as he went and it came to pass as he met them he said unto them tell me come together liar the son of a high camp was Gedera alive he had killed Gedera liar and was telling them and weeping and says come to get a liar uh, to miss him and then it goes on to say in uh, verse uh, in verse 7 and it was and it was so when they came into the midst of the city that Ishmael the son of uh, Nathaniah, what did he do? A man that was crying, he was weeping. The soft man, the sorrowful man, this dejected man, this man that could not hurt an aunt. All these 80 people came, said, Come, let's go to the house of Gedaliah, come and see him. And when he got there, he turned around. All the tears were dried up and he slew all of them. Human beings, those who do not have Christ, you want to have a deal with them and you are going with them. You don't have anybody supporting you. And there you are alone with that wicked man and they can pretend. And so the people you think are angels unmask them. When we come to the ministry, we need to have the sharp sightedness. And we need to understand it's not everyone that comes. I look at him like an angel. I look at him like a soft man, a person that cannot hurt anybody. You don't look at people like that. You will wear your spiritual eyeglasses and you will see very well. And then you see through all those pretenses and all the crying so that you'll not bring anybody into the kingdom of God that shouldn't be there. That's why the Lord is telling us, look at, we we'll refer to this. Let's look at this again in First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, and here we're reading from verse 22. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 22 here is uh, the counseling and the commandment and the word of god for those of us who are leaders and we're making choice of people to come into the kingdom or to come into the service of the lord it says lay hands suddenly on no man lay hands suddenly on no man it's just telling us beware of angels at first sight Beware of angels at first sight, covering up atrocities, covering up abominations, and covering up abominable abnormalities. Uh, to, to which angel are you entrusting your life? To which angels, in quotes, are you entrusting your family? You're traveling out. And then you hand over your family into the hands of an angel of God. You can't do any evil thing. Because, you know, I know them. They're good. I've never found any fault in them. And to which angel are you entrusting your life savings? You know, you're going to the ATM. Who oh, is my, is my friend? Come on, come on. And then what are the numbers you are punching there? You don't know. Okay. Stay there. Let me dictate the digits to you. And then, because, you know, he's an angel. And I can take him to the ATM and he can put all those things in. And then, okay, swap that cash. And then, okay, what do you do before you do? I do this, I do this. And then, you're taking that man there. Go back there the following week. They wiped out everything there. 
and they take 50,000 away and leave 1,000 for you so that uh, you'll be able to take transportation back home. Those people, angels of God, I pray God will deliver you. Yeah. We need to be watchful. And when you meet somebody, the person might be a Christian, no doubt, but watch them. See them first. Stand your ground first. And hold what you have first. Maybe later, after you've seen them, after many years, and you know now this one is trustworthy, then you can go along with them. And your ministry, your ministry. You don't want to hand over your ministry to the hands of somebody. I met him yesterday, and I saw him, as I saw him like this, I saw the glory of God. God upon him and I see an angel of the Lord right there I hand over the ministry unto him you've made a great mistake leave that your angel let him go aside let's carry on the ministry if he's an angel God will prove him out give me a good amen yeah. I come to point number two now and it's uh, the undoing of apprehensive angels in ministry we're coming to second samuel chapter 14 second samuel i'm reading from chapter 14 and we're looking at verse 17 second samuel chapter 14 and we're reading from verse 17 then the handmaid said the word of my lord the king it shall now be comfortable for as an angel of god so is my lord the king to discern uh, both the good and bad. Therefore, the Lord thy God will be with thee. Here is the wise woman. Uh, let, let's come to verse 1. I'm reading from verse 1 of this uh, for second, uh, Samuel chapter 14. It says, Now Joab, the son of Zeruiah, perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom, and Joab said to Tekoa, and fetched this a wise woman a wise woman underline that word wise but you know there are many kinds of wisdom there are people who are wise to get you into trouble there are people who are wise to make you make decisions that will ruin your life and get into decisions they're wise enough to just change your mind and get you to decisions that will run you off the throne eventually that will destroy you and, dest and destroy you. That's their wisdom. This is a wise woman and said unto her, I pray thee, feign thyself, pre pretend thyself to be a mourner and put on now mourning apparel and appoint uh, and anoint not thy thyself with oil, but be as a woman uh, that, had, that had a long time mourned for the dead and come to the king and speak on this matter unto him so joab put the words in her mouth well to start with david was now a king we're now in second samuel and david as a king had soldiers had army had all these people around him and yet he was very much accessible to everybody and uh, there's no there's, uh, there's no evidence that he knew this woman before and then the woman beat all the security and all the guards and everybody and came to david directly you know they say you have an open policy anybody can get to you anytime maybe that's good maybe it has a negative side too that anybody can get there anytime and get at you anytime because you're always available. David was available. I pray your availability will not destroy you. Amen. You'll be wise. Amen. Do you get what we are talking about tonight? Look at this, verse 4. And when the woman of Tekoa spake to the king, she fell on her face, don't be deceived, to the ground, and did obeisance and said help O king and the king said unto her what he left thee and she answered i mean did a widow woman and mine husband is dead i don't know why people will say things 
about their families and put a curse on themselves and kill their husbands with their mouths. My husband is dead. And this is just drama. And there are people that come out and they would say, I don't know why they, why they do that. They see they are glorifying God. I had cancer. And a man did not have cancer. And I came to the meeting. What's the purpose? You're putting cancer on yourself. And then I was prayed for. And in a moment of time, the cancer went away. And the people clapped. They're clapping because you said you had cancer. You have not got it yet, but it's coming. Because you pronounce that for yourself. What's your goal? What's your purpose? How do you come out to say, I'm a widow. My husband is dead. And it was Job that put the word in her mouth. You know what people do? And sometimes, uh, you don't want to repeat what they say. You don't want to say, I heard that man say, he had this, and God did this. I don't want to repeat that. Because I don't know, I don't understand why they say that. Or maybe, I had this, I had that. And there was nothing true about that. Human nature is coming back again. But you know, the people, you won't see them later. Because it may take a year before that cancer comes on them. It may take five years because already it's recorded down. The man said, I had cancer. And God knows he never had any cancer. And now he says, I had cancer. And this happened. I pity them. If you could follow their history, and if you could follow them in life, you will see what will happen to them. Because they say that in the presence of the angels of God. Angels are there. That's why it says, let the women cover their head because of the angels in worship. And angels, they take that message back. And that man said he had cancer. Check up the records. No, he's not got it here, but he's coming. That other man said he had this. It's not there yet, but it's coming. Because they've said it already. I pray God will help us. Yeah. And then those of us who are interviewing people, when they come out, you know, we're interviewing there for testimonies. And then they say this, this, and this. And then we're so eager. We push them out. First of all, they're thinking, you know, I fooled them. Those deeper life uh, leaders and pastors, I fooled them. And I told them my story. And they just said, come on, come on. You'll be number one. You need to say this. Everybody needs to hear this. And then the man is thinking, these people, I thought they had the spirit of God. And I told them a lie. They pushed me forward. And then when they come there, they say something different from what they actually told you. They now say they add to it and embellish everything. You know, and what they are saying they have. Follow them in life, they are going to have. Because it's the law of sowing and reaping. And I know that. That's why sometimes I'm not even interested in what some of those people are saying. Because I know that I can see through that thing. I say that when he's telling us a story. And it's a story somebody puts in his mouth. That's, that's what we find here. And this a woman of Tekoa. This is what is, she said. My husband is dead. Sisters, are you there? Your husband will not die. Yeah. And brothers, are you there? Yeah. Your wives will not die. Yeah. We've come out of all these things. And as we come out of them, we're free. Yeah. You are going to live long. Yeah. And the protection of God will be upon you. Yeah. Your children will not die. Yeah. And the diseases that other people are claiming they had, which they've not got yet, will never come near you in Jesus' name. And then in verse, you know, it goes on to say that uh, two of my children were fighting together. Listen to this. Two of my children fighting together and one killed the other. That's not true. That's what Joab told her to say. And how do people come and they say, I have two children. And one was fighting with the other one in the field and killed the other one. And see what's going to happen in their family. Because the same each in the presence of God. In the presence of the angels of God. And then look at this in verse 10. And the king said, Whosoever shall, whosoever uh, saith the ought unto thee, 
bring him to me, and he shall not touch thee anymore. Then says she, I pray thee, let the king remember the Lord thy God, bring it in the name of God, that thou wouldest not suffer the revenge of blood to destroy any more, lest they destroy my son. And he said, as the Lord liveth, there shall not one heir of thy son fall to the earth. Then the woman said, Let thy handmaid, I pray thee, speak one word unto my lord, the king. And he said, Say on. And the woman said, Wherefore then, as thou thought such a sin against the people of God? For the king doth speak the sin as one which is faulty. Look at this woman, a stranger. Meeting the king for the first time. And look at the language now. That's how they start. You know, you give in to them like that, and you give listening ear. You'll be surprised how they become rude. They become impolite. And look at this strange woman that we don't even know the address of her house. We don't even know her quality as standing in the nation. And she's saying, the king is faulty. Look at that talking about our king, talking about David. And then he goes on and he says, in that the king does not fetch home again is banished. It's not coming to the point. For we must needs die. And as water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again, Neither does God respect any person, yet does he devise, uh, does he devise means that is banished, be not expelled from him. Now therefore, that I am come to speak of this thing unto the Lord, the, unto my Lord the King. Then he goes on to say, it is because the people have made me afraid, and thy handmaid said, I will now speak unto the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his handmaid. We're not even sure what she's talking about, but she understood herself. For the king will hear to deliver uh, the, his, uh, his handmaid out of the hands of the man that will destroy me and my son together out of the inheritance of God then thy handmaid said the word of my lord the king shall now be comfortable for as an angel of God flattery comes in now so is my lord the king to discern good and evil. Therefore, the Lord thy God be with thee. Aha, uh -huh, verse 18. Then the king answered and said unto the woman, Hide not from me, I pray thee, the thing that I shall ask thee. And the woman said, Let my Lord the king now speak. And the king said, Is not the hand of Joab with thee in all this, all this story, all this explanation? You're a widow, and one of the children had been killed by the other one. And you're looking for protection for yourself and that son. Tell me, tell me the truth. Is not this the handwork of Joab? Think about that. And think about the people that, you know, arrange uh, things like this in the days in which we live. And then they come to you. They take your precious time. And then you give them listening ears. And they tell all these stories. And then they want to test you. Say you are saved and you are sanctified. And you are filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay, if you are filled with the Holy Ghost. And Ananias and Sapphira came to Peter. And we see the evidence was filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? Is this not like this and like that? And he fell down and he died. And when they come to you and they tell all those long stories and they see that you are not like Peter, they, say, they can size you up. They say, we can sell him anything. 
we can tell him anything we can dramatize anything before him before her because she is not like uh, peter and but now this man this david said tell me this isn't this the word of joab that she he put in your mouth and then look at this now verse 19 the king said it's not the hand of job of you in all this sin and the woman answered and said as thy soul liveth, my lord the king none can turn to the right or to the left from aught that the, the lord that my lord the king has spoken for thy servant joab thy servant joab understand that that's to soften the crime of job is still thy servant he respects you thy servant joab he he bid me and put all these words in my mouth in the mouth of thine handmaid verse 20 to fetch about the form of speech and as uh, and as thy servant Joab done this sin, and my Lord, she comes back now, is wise according to the wisdom, tell me, of an angel of God to know all things that are done, not only in Jerusalem, all things that are done, not only in Israel, this is flattery. All things that are done where? In the earth. That's how my Lord is. Well, they, they to cut a long story short what she intended is that absalom will be recalled back home and that was done and so the game actually succeeded but look at this what happened then as absalom came in number one it opened the door for absalom the traitor wise woman wise talk great story great drama one thing it did it opened the door for absalom the traitor to come near the king and to come into the palace to come to the kingdom number two it caused the abominable defilement in the palace of david when um, absalom eventually drove out david Ahithophel counseled him. He said, mess up with all the women that your father David left behind. Such abomination had never happened before in the land of Israel. And it was this counseling or this interaction with this wise woman calling him angel of God. It was that that brought in that abomination into the land. Number three, that association of this wise woman with David drove Ahithophel to suicide and hellfire. Eventually, Ahithophel committed suicide and went to hellfire. Were it not for this interaction with David of the wise woman, all these things will not happen. Absalom will not come back. That association or connection will not be made. Ahithophel will not have gone to hell so prematurely. Verse number four. It resulted in the greatest affliction David ever went through in his life. That little talk, that little interaction is like the angel of God. That thing that brought Absalom in resulted in the greatest affliction that David ever experienced. It led, number five, thousands of Israelites to unnecessary death and eternal damnation. Many of them died when the battle eventually arose. And let's look at uh, Second Samuel chapter 18 from verse 6. Second Samuel chapter 18. We're reading from verse 6. And then you will see how many people lost their lives just because of this unnecessary battle. So the people went out into the field against Israel. And the battle was in the wood of Ephraim, where the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David. And there was there a great slaughter that day of how many people? 20,000 men. Wise woman, this is the result of your work. 
the result of your talk. Because of that talk with David. And David said, all right, you want Absalom back? Let's listen for all this lengthy discussion, all this lengthy talk. All this, uh, you know, your husband is dead, you're a widow, and two of your children fought together, one killed the other, and you're now seeking protection for the one alive. The result is, you want Absalom back? Okay, let him come back. And then 20,000 people lost their lives. Not only that, number five, it, um, number six, rather, it plunged Absalom himself into sudden death and suffering in hell. You see, Absalom actually should have been killed before this time. Because Absalom had arranged that Amnon should be killed. And according to the law in the land of Israel, which the king should have written down, and the king of Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 17, should have followed the law of Moses word for word. And when Absalom arranged for Amnon to be killed, that man, Absalom, should have been killed. That's why he ran away into self-exile, because he knew the consequence of what he had done. And because David will not do what should have been done, one man had been spared, Absalom. And now thousands of people have died and Absalom eventually died. There's no point, uh, you know, protecting the criminal, protecting the backslider. Because that backslider eventually, the judgment will come. And the judgment will come upon many other people. Not only this, it weakens the kingdom of David ever after. That kingdom of David was never as strong as it was because of this interaction with the woman that came and said, you are as an angel of God. I pray God will deliver you for flattery. Are you there? I said God will deliver us in Jesus' name. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 29. You want to mark this in your Bible. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 5. I'm waiting for you to open it. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 5. Have you opened it? Uh-huh. I'm going to make you read, so I'm not going to allow you to say yes when there's no yes there. Are you there now? Yes. Proverbs 29, verse 5, 1, 2, 3, go. Uh, that's what they did. A man that flattereth his neighbor, a woman, wise woman of Tekoa, a woman that flattereth his neighbor, spreadeth a net for his feet. The question I'm going to ask before we go off from that point number two, where was the wise woman who flattered David as an angel of God when all these upheavals shook the nation? and shook the kingdom and shook the king himself where was the woman silent in retrospection she has now forever been silenced by retribution silenced by retrospection thinking back on what he had done couldn't come out and we can't see a picture anymore we can't see a presence anymore now retribution takes over and forever, she is now suffering for the evil she has done. We're coming to Second uh, Samuel, chapter nineteen. Second Samuel, chapter nineteen, and we're reading from verse twenty-five. Second Samuel, chapter nineteen. And we're reading from verse 25. And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem. That's when the king uh, came back to Jerusalem to meet. And so when um, this man came to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest thou not with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, thy servant deceived me. Um, for thy servant said, I will settle me there uh, and ask that I may ride thereon and go to the king because thy servant is lame and he has landed thy servant unto my lord the king. But my lord the king, uh, tell me, is as an angel of God. That's what they always say. I don't understand why David has not caught this language. 
I don't understand why David has not come off this. We're coming from 1 Samuel chapter 29. You are as an angel of God. And we come to chapter 14. You are as an angel of God. And we see the destruction, devastation, the danger of what that kind of angel of God, angel of God, what it produced. But, you know, a man likes to be pumped up, lifted up, and promoted, and put upon a pedestal that he really doesn't have. But if you become self um, kind of effacing, you don't want all that kind of flattery. You don't want all that kind of title. You say, Lord, I just want to serve you. I do not allow these people that are coming. You are like an angel of God. You'll be totally free from danger in Jesus' name. It says, you know, the, you're like an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thy sight. Well, when you read the whole story, he was actually looking for how he would have some of the inheritance back that uh, one of the servants had taken. Uh, the Lord is uh, telling us today that we shouldn't allow what people say to make us forget who we are and what decisions we ought to take. If we're discerning and people just come to flatter us or to lift us up and you say that this is who you are and you bite that and you're taking that bait, you might destroy your life. And to be forewarned is to be forearmed. The Lord will arm you. He will protect you. He will preserve you. All these deceivers who are going about saying, you are like an angel of God. You are like an angel of God. You are like an angel of God. They will not catch you in Jesus' name. In summary, accept no flattering title accept no flattering title but live in reality as an angel of god you don't want to accept the title but you want to see look at the angels of god and look at how they live how should i live apart from what the people are saying apart from their flattery don't accept the flattering title but you live as an angel of god how number one obedient obedient we're looking at some 103 psalm 103 and we're reading from verse 20 psalm 103 we're looking at verse 20 bless the lord ye his angels that excel in strength that do his commandments hacking acting unto the voice of his word that's how, how angels behave don't accept the title but live like an angel of god obedient number two pure and clean pure and clean we're looking at zechariah chapter three zechariah chapter three and we're reading from verse three in zechariah chapter three Reading from verse 3, it tells us about angels, they are cleaner and they are pure. Chapter 3, verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spoke unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will close thee with change of raiment. The Lord will close thee with righteousness. And I said, Let them set a fair matter upon his said. So they said a fair matter upon his said, and closed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then shall thou also judge my house, and shall also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. He'll make you to become, uh, to come to the company of the angels. If you will have a pure life and a clean life. So, although you are not accepting the title of an angel of the Lord, flattering title, but you want to live like one. Number one, obedient. Number two, pure and clean. Number three, holy. We're looking at Matthew. Matthew chapter 25. 
Matthew chapter 25, we're reading from verse 31. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in the glory and all his holy angels with him. Holy angels with him. Angels are holy. You are not accepting flattery title, but you are living as an angel of God. You are clean and pure. You are obedient. You are holy. Then you are Christ-like. Christ-like. Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians chapter 4, we are reading from verse 14. Galatians chapter 4, we are looking at verse 14. He wants us to be Christ-like. He tells us in verse 14 of Galatians chapter 4, And my temptation which, which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus, the life of Christ, the life of Christ in us will live as an angel of God, even as Christ also will become irresistible, irresistible ministry, irresistible in anointing, irresistible in the power of the Lord. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, we're reading from verse 10. In verse 10 it says, And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he speak. Look at verse 15, last verse. And all that saw, all that such in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. That's Stephen. Be like that. You're irresistible. Title, forget about title. All the names and nomenclature, forget about that. All the flatteries of the people, forget about that. Just have the life. Demonstrate the life. That number one, by the grace of God, you're obedient. By the grace of God, you are clean and pure. By the grace of God, you are holy. By the grace of God, you are Christ-like. By the grace of God, you are irresistible. Number six, you are fervent. You are fervent. It tells us in Psalm 104. Psalm 104. We're looking at verse 4. Here is what the Lord wants us to have as ministers of the watch of the Lord. Psalm 104. And we're looking at verse 4. In verse 4, it says, In verse 4, it tells us, Who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flaming fire fervent fiery that's what the lord wants of us and then you become a shining star a shining star you will shine your light will shine the glory of god will shine upon you it tells us in revelation chapter 1 verse 20 the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Those are leaders of the churches. Become a shining star. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the Lord is telling us, don't worry about title. Bishop, archbishop, priest, whatever. Don't worry about that. Or you are this and that. Don't worry about that. Watch the life of an angel. The life of an angel. And the power and the strength and the ability of an angel and the spirit of God upon your life and nobody will be able to stand before you all the days of your life in Jesus name Amen. every place the soul of your foot shall tread upon the Lord will give unto you Amen. this work will prosper in your hand Amen. God will build a wall of fire around you Amen. that when all those psychophants and all those uh, pretending hypocrites when they come they will not be able to penetrate. And when they open their mouth and they say, hey, praise the Lord, I came to see you, angel of God. Uh -uh, stop right there. Stop right there. I'm just a child of God. I'm not, you know, what you think. All the title, cancel that. And then the power of the Holy Ghost will move through you in Jesus' name. Amen. I look at conquering people tonight. Victorious people tonight. And all those things that come against your life to ruin your ministry and to put you down, they are cancelled tonight in Jesus' name. Rise up in the strength of the Lord. You will overcome. You will overcome. 
all the women of Teco and all the other people that are coming and they want to deceive you and get the good thing out of your hand, they will not succeed. The Lord has put you in place and nobody will take this good thing away from your hand in Jesus' name. Tell the Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what I've learned today. Tell the Lord that you will be a victorious person and no deception will catch you and uh, no power will touch your life. You're going to succeed by the grace of God. This work will prosper in your hand.